about digital online action and the research that we are doing and we would like to share it with you. Um, so first, some introductions. Uh, my name is Marlene. I um, have been involved in the activist movement for about 12 years now uh, and been involved in different movements uh, from squatting movement to climate movement, feminist groups, uh, and I mean, in the end, it's about system change. It's about movements that are connected, uh, intersectionality, if some of you know. Uh, so if you start with activism, you end up from here to there to everywhere. Um, yeah, I've been involved in different social spaces. I love to cook vegan food. Um, I'm a vegan myself, and I love to share that with people. Um, yeah, I'm schooled as a graphic designer. I've been working as a graphic designer. Uh, not for commercial work, but often uh, for the movement uh, and for different organizations. And the last three years I am working at Greenpeace as an action coordinator. Um, yeah, so we thought for the introduction it's nice to show uh, an image of an action that both of us have been, or me in this case, have been involved in. Uh, this was an action, um, one of my first climbing actions at Greenpeace. Uh, this is, was me, I was on, a, uh, on the roof of Shell HQ in The Hague, uh, where we were protesting against Arctic drilling. And I was sitting there for some hours, at some point you get arrested, the police take you down. Uh, so we were going through the building of Shell, and I was wearing still this uh, big suit as a polar bear. And it's walking like really big and heavy, because it's big. Uh, and then when I came down and I took off this uh, polar bear head, the police was a bit shocked that there was a blonde lady in it. And it was like the perfect picture that uh, the photographer took. And it's always nice to share. So, about Maarten. Yeah, I'm Maarten. I also work at uh, Greenpeace. But I started, uh, after high school, I did uh, study artificial intelligence. Uh, and I, yeah. I was always talking about left activist things, uh, but then I got into doing some privacy workshops, and then I rolled into the student movement, and from there it all went really fast, and now I'm, uh, well, very deep into the climate movement and the nature movement. I sometimes play guitar, but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a process. <laughs> and I also have a picture. Um, this is in the Stedderbos last year where we occupied the forest. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and in this photo, I, I just got on food. So that was really uh, <laughs> one of the highlights of the, of the, one of the, of the 12 days the I, was, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> So, and yeah, this is not a talk about Greenpeace, but uh, just to give a little bit of background info, because uh, maybe not everyone knows, but Greenpeace is quite old for the organization, the, the type of organization that it is, uh, 50 years. And we're all around the world. And there's uh, many offices in different countries and regions. And we've been fighting to preserve nature and for peace. Um, for 50 years, and we have a lot of experience in that. So we do a lot of actions, but we also do research. We go to the nature areas, and we fight court cases. And this is why we think we're like uniquely, uniquely. Um, it, make, it makes it possible for us to try to bring civil disobedience into the online world. And if you, no, if you have uh, qu questions about Greenpeace, then uh, we can talk about it completely after the talk. If you have questions about the talk itself, we can do it. Um, there's room for that still. <laughs> yeah, so um, first we want to talk a bit more about how we get to this topic. Um, so in 2014, I, I was a volunteer at Greenpeace, and I also did some internship work. Um, I also came to Greenpeace and said, like, isn't it interesting to look at if we can do digital actions? Um, and that's already quite some time ago. Uh, the year after, uh, I organized um, a hackathon. 
where, we, where the challenge was to look into the data of fishing vessels that go around the whole world, uh, and at some point they can take off their tracking system or turn it off, and we basically don't know what they're doing in areas. So the, during this weekend, there were more than 30 people. Uh, we looked into the topic. We got a lot of data from AIS systems, uh, and we uh, learned a lot about what we can do if they turn off their systems. So that was, for Greenpeace and for us, a really valuable moment, but also for the people who joined, because they really liked it to be working together with Greenpeace and to do something that would preserve nature, preserve uh, the oceans. Um, so after that, we wanted to continue with, like, what can we do with data, with online activism? And so together with a colleague, with Bob, uh, I set up an e-activist uh, team at Greenpeace. And this is basically a team that does more innocent online actions. Uh, so they write Google reviews, they put pictures uh, at a bad company uh, about their destruction. Uh, and all kinds of actions we did. They were very useful. They were, they, it still exists, this team, so we're still doing these kind of actions, often to support offline actions. Uh, and it's, it's really a nice uh, extra and new tool uh, in, our, um, in, our, in our way of ex activism. So yeah, next, um, now, or the last year, I've been looking into like, how can we do digital disobedient actions? Um, but before we really get into that, we want to give you a bit more context about what disobedience means, uh, but also how Greenpeace does that, and how we um, have court cases, how we win court cases, because this is really important to understand why we believe it, it could be possible. Yeah, so first about um, what is civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action. Uh, because there's this concept in our society, civil disobedience, and it's meant to, um, to fight things that are a greater cause than yourself. Um, and you need to well, uphold a certain number of criteria in order to, for it to match that uh, civil disobedience definition. Um, for example, uh, you need to have a lawful excuse, which is, um, let's say your neighbor's house is on fire, and you break down the door or the window to save the baby sleeping inside, uh, then you're breaking the law because you cannot break windows, but you have a lawful excuse because the, uh, the house is on fire. And for the same way, it's like the planet is on fire, so sometimes it might be uh, justified to block shell, for example. Um, you have to be really careful about safety of everyone involved, that's for our activists, but also for the police people and for the workers at the sites that you do actions at. Um, and you have to... Uh, subsidiarity is when you um, first exhaust all other possible means to fight for your uh, cause. So if you start with petitions and then you do demonstrations and it still doesn't work, then that might, then you almost have to uh, take the next step. Then you're uh, justified for that. But you also have to be proportional. So if you're uh, fighting a very big thing, then um, it's, it's um, proportional to, for example, with the Stedibus, uh, we have a big nature crisis going on, and then you sleep in, in a tree, in a forest. That's, that's a small thing. Let's see if I forgot anything. With Greenpeace, we're very, and also for civil disobedience, uh, non-violent. So violence is a very vague concept. Um, but we're very strict, never violence against uh, people. And, and if you have to do violence against objects, objects rather not. Uh, but sometimes you need to maybe uh, break through a fence, or for example. But non-violent, as much as possible. And as I said, there's no personal gain to be had from doing uh, civil disobedience. So it's really for the bigger cause. And uh, all this together uh, makes it so that uh, judges think like, OK, this is, they're changing the world. They're fighting for a bigger cause. And that is nice. And NVDA is um, uh, a, sub a subset of civil disobedience where you directly go to the um, to the activity that's, that's doing harm. For example, uh, you shut down the coal-fired power station. It's a direct action, and you directly stop the activity. And so one example 
um, I can just play, right? Yeah. yeah. This is in Germany. Sound. It would be nice if there's sounds. <laughs> So every year there are big actions in Germany called Ende Gelände and they are a really nice example of people power, people doing action to stop uh, fossil fuel industry, in this case lignite uh, mining. And they're very... Uh, yeah. The whole terrain of action. A thousand to fifteen hundred have come from all over Europe. We're here to stop the trains from coming across the tracks because we believe in climate justice and we want the coal to stay in the ground. I feel it's an honor to be here, so <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very happy. We know that you're lying. to act in every way we can, and civil disobedience is one of this. Whatever it takes, we have to stop coal. The people got the power! The people got the power! Tell me, can you feel it? Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty nice, where thousands of people come together, and if you want, you can go again this uh, summer, they're, they're organizing. In August? Uh, in August, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but one, another example, this is uh, Amsterdam. Uh, it's a really nice uh, field of grass in the city center. Um, but what I didn't know at least is that it used to be a highway uh, right through, the, through Amsterdam. And people really didn't like this, actually, because they really didn't like cars. Um, and they thought, yeah, we just should take the bike. So they got on the highway, and they did like a die-in. Um, and they took their bikes, as you can see. And this is civil disobedience that changed the highway to a nice field of grass. And I think that's an um, important part uh, of civil disobedience. It has shaped the world around us uh, for the better. <laughs> uh, from the same plane to voting rights for women, uh, to the eight-hour workday, to abortion rights. Um, it, yeah, it has shaped the world around us. So um, we think it's important. Yeah, so um, now uh, we would like to talk a bit about how we do these actions at Greenpeace. Like Marta said, Greenpeace has been doing actions for uh, around the world for more than for 50 years now. And there's a lot of experience and knowledge uh, here in the Netherlands, but also in, of course, many other places in the world. Um, so when preparing an action at Greenpeace, um, that's my work, uh, basically, every detail counts. So the moment we depart from our warehouse till the second we go onto a gas rig, as we see here in the picture, um, that we already prepare what happens if we get a court case. We already do everything in advance. We know everything that could possibly go wrong or what could happen. And that's super important to be prepared, especially in court. So what happened in this case? I'm going to take you through uh, one action that happened in 2018 because it's just a very interesting example. So um, there was a company called uh, Hansa, and they were planning to uh, start drilling for gas uh, in Schiermonnik Oog, uh, in the Waddenzee, which is a nature area, even a Nature 2000 area. Uh, the, the Dutch government has been working for years on it to get it flourish as a nature reserve, and then suddenly there's this company saying, so we're gonna get some gas there. It's gonna destroy the nature. Um, besides destroying nature, uh, the people who live there, they didn't want any of this happening in their backyards. They didn't want anything of this happening in this beautiful nature reserve. Uh, so the people, they contacted Greenpeace. Uh, beforehand, Greenpeace was already in touch with Hansa, the company that was planning to drill for the gas, um, to say, hey, if you're going to do something, let us know. They said, okay, we will let you know if we're going to start drilling, because uh, we need to uh, tell that in advance, uh, because we're preparing it, because the government needs to know. That's how it works. But they didn't. They just announced, we're going to start drilling next week. 
So in a week time, Greenpeace prepared this action. Often we take months to prepare, but here it was one week uh, where we took off from Amsterdam all the way to Schiermonnik Oog. And in preparation of this action, like I said, we think about every single detail. So we think about how are we going to contact uh, the owner, Hansa, but also we need to contact the authorities that we're doing an action. So when you're doing an action in the area of an oil rig, this is important for the legal case after, um, there is a mining law. And this means you cannot be in the area of this mining activity in 500 meters. So we had to stay out of this 500 meters. Uh, and that's what we did with our big ship. We had a Baluga with us, it's a sailing vessel. Um, and it was outside of this 500 meter border. But we had also had our ribs with us. And those could go into this 500 meter area because uh, the rig is supplied uh, also with small ribs that there's no danger of any, uh, anything uh, um, collapsing into the rig. So we knew that and that's why we took the ribs to bring, it, to bring the activists to the rig. And what also happened at the same time is the moment we start this action, we called the owner, we called the authorities, we're gonna do an action. We weren't even on the rig yet, but we prevented uh, already that in the court case they would say, you're there, was dangerous, we didn't know, we were planning to mine, blah, 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 blah. So we already knew we need to let them know in advance, and we are so fast that they're unable to stop us uh, before we're already on the rig, before they're there. So um, this is very important in the legal process. So here the activists go onto the rib, they go into the, onto the, uh, the rig. Uh, after 24 hours, the activists were taken off the oil rig, and that already um, uh, took care of a lot of media attention, uh, and it uh, made the discussion really start in the Netherlands about drilling for gas in a nature reserve. So that's basically the goal um, for that action, and it really worked. But then after, um, there is always the pub public prosecutor saying, hey, I want to uh, have those activists uh, being punished because they did something that is not allowed. Um, so what the public prosecutor said is that the mining law is more important than the right to protest, that the action was totally unsafe, and that there are less invasive ways of making your point. So they say, we shouldn't have gone on the, onto the rig, we should have just talked to them. But of course, it doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, this is a lot of text, but it's, uh, it's just very interesting. This is, what the, uh, this is the verdict of the judge. In the end, all the charges were dropped. The, judge, the judges basically said that the right to protest is more important than the mining law, which is already really exceptional, that's really, really quite amazing that they said that because often uh, economy and money goes before uh, ideological and activism. Um, but what they also said, and here I wrote it down a bit more concise, um, is that again, uh, the mining law is not uh, absolute. It's um, uh, the right to protest is more important. Um, the mining company started to test unexpected. That's why Greenpeace couldn't do anything else to, had, like we said, the subsidiarity. So we couldn't get into touch with them. They were just on their way and we were too late to basically go into a discussion. Uh, there was no safety risk. So this is all what the judge said. Huh? Um, the action was well prepared and well documented. And the, they even said Greenpeace was a, is a large and professional organization that should really address these kind of topics. Uh, there was open communication with the authorities um, the action was limited, um, yeah, they had a clear target. So in the end, it was also for us, it was really special that they really set this mining law aside and they said the right to protest is more important. And that was really a big victory. So again, in this, like I said, essential is the subsidiarity and the proportionality because that's where the judge really looks at. So why I'm telling all of this is because basically what we're doing uh, is, uh, if you think about it, like if I'm myself, if I just go take a boat and I'm going to row to a rig and I'm going to climb on it, I will probably be uh, prosecuted. I will probably get a fine or a jail time. Because it's so unclear what I'm doing there, I'm one person, they don't understand it, 
But if you're doing that with a big organization, if you have a clear story, uh, and if you have a clear goal, it can change. So the question now is, the one I wrote down here, yeah. anyhow, so when we talk about digital action, digital disobedient action, um, we think digital action equals high fines and jail time. Uh, because that's basically what you hear a lot when people do something online that's not allowed, that there are a lot of media attention and that people get high fines if they're found uh, because often you're anonymous. Um, yeah, if it works, let me know. Um, yeah, so the last year, year and a half, uh, we've been doing really extensive uh, research um, where we talk to lawyers who are uh, specialized in the right to protest, uh, but also um, as, as, uh, cyber, uh, cyber crime lawyers um, who have advised us and we have been talking about like how does that work and how do you, could you move like right to protest, the European right into a digital area? And they say it's, it should be possible, it should be it's very interesting to quest, ask, ask this question because it hasn't been done like this before. Uh, of course, we know actions that are done uh, anonymously, by example, anonymous, um, but no one knows who they are. But if you would do a digital action and say, hey, we're Greenpeace, we've done that, and we are standing for what we're doing, and we can explain to you how we did it, and, how, and what we've done, and why we did it, like copy what we, did, what we do offline, uh, and we often win, and we always win those court cases uh, offline. How come you can't copy that to an online place? So again, we said, we're still researching. Eh? We want to know everything about this. Uh, if we can't guarantee safety, if we can't guarantee the safety of the activist, of, of, uh, of anyone who's involved, of even the companies that we might hack, uh, then we won't do it. Um, so basically what I'm saying is that I or we think that the risk isn't as high as I expected before. Uh, there are laws already made on this topic, cybercrime, crime, and we've seen that, of course, in the news. Um, but there's also a part in this law that talks about ideological action. Um, so that means that there's already a chapter, a chapter written uh, in het wetboek van strafrecht. I don't know how to say that in English. <laughs> um, uh, saying that it's they already thought about, like, what if you hack something with an ideological uh, stance, with an ideological view? And then, of course, we look into a jurisprudence. So what has been done before? Have there been court cases uh, done against activists who do digital actions? And, of course, we look at the European context. Uh, you can, can look into many places in the world. U.S., uh, there's often these can, things happen with... Um, um, Snowden, and well, we're, we're in Europe, so we look at European law. Uh, and one action we did find was um, a DDoS attack on Lufthansa, uh, done by activists who didn't want uh, undocumented refugees to be deported. Uh, and Lufthansa was taking them and taking them to another location. So they DDoSed um, openly, hey, we did this, this is my name, um, as a form of demonstration. And they won this court case. Uh, so they were not prosecuted for anything. And that's the one case we can find, in, it was in Germany, uh, that happened where activists said, we did this, uh, it was a direct action, um, but the judge said it is, it is okay to do it because it was a demonstration. And that's really interesting. Yeah, so, screens are not on yet. <laughs> um, so if we really want to start with doing actions, we really need to prepare. Um, because how would you copy these, uh, the things we prepare uh, when we do a physical actions for an online action? Um, like we say, yeah, the subsidiarity and proportionality, proportionality nality, are very important. Uh, subsidiarity depends on the target. Hey, mm. yes, that talks a bit easier because it's a lot of text. Um, yeah, so the subsidiarity, it depends on the target. So for example, if we want to do a digital action on Shell, um, I mean, we have, we've got a history with Shell. 
we had done many actions on Shell. So we don't really need to explain why we're doing more heavy actions, for example, or digital actions on Shell, because we have been doing that for years. Um, so that depends on the target. But if you want to do a proportional action, that's a bit of a difficult one. That's something that, we, that I've been thinking about. Like, what is a small action online? What is something big? What is something that's really disruptive? And how would a judge look at that? Um, and how can we track every, every step we take online? So for example, if we climb a building, you can basically say, yeah, we went to that fence, then we went there, we went to take that ladder, and we're up the building. But how would you do that online? How can you track that? How can you show that you haven't been looking into places where you find credit card data or anything else? Um, yeah, so again, the thorough legal advice. Huh? We don't want any risks. Uh, we want to make sure that no one gets in jail. And if they are not, uh, possible, then we don't do it. Uh, also something I was thinking about, can someone uh, experienced, um, an experienced hacker prepare an action and that a Gre Greenpeace prominent, for example, the director, presses a button and he does it. He does the hack. Um, because that, you know, in the, in the discussion, that could really help. Um, and as always, a risk assessment. Yeah, so... Now we're uh, in the process of um, well, all the technical stuff, but it's also um, wh what are we actually going to do? Um, we are very good at uh, doing uh, banner drops, but what would the digital banner drop look like? And um, we, it's quite obvious if you block the entrance to uh, Shell, but can we also do a direct action online and how would it look like? And maybe the m most interesting one, uh, or challenging one at least, is the mass action where you have, uh, you saw the video of Anne Glenn with thousands of people. Can we do it online in a disruptive manner? Um, and then, yeah, make it, make it happen. <laughs> because um, the world is warming, <laughs> and nowadays um, you have, this is, from the global south, but on the right side of the screen, it's, it's in Europe now, and even in the Netherlands where we have floods. So there's no escaping it anymore, and something uh, yeah, needs to be done. And then we're at the question part. How much time do we have, 15? Okay, so we have time for questions, um, and we would love to hear anything, if you have any remarks or questions or uh, also, uh, later we have more time. You can also come to us. We will be here the whole day, also on Monday. So, uh, any questions? Oh, yeah. Is this, oh yeah, it's also working. Like, what you described is how can you prove that you're not hacking the company or not accessing the database or accessing confidential information? Can you talk a bit closer? Oh, I can... Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the most important thing with it is, like, what you described with a DDoS attack, it's impossible to hack anything with it. It's just disrupting their services, but it's not hacking it. You're not accessing the database. You can prove this to everyone, that there are certain types of cyber attacks which, which are impossible to lead to an actual hack. Mm. And that's the, the most powerful thing of it. Also what you said, like, how can I have many people uh, attack Shell, for example? Like, take the most busy page of Shell, the, the page which takes the most time to load, maybe their login page to their oil platform, or take some page which is very slow to load and speak a time globally and everyone refresh the page constantly. Everyone, everyone on the, at, at the team start refreshing the page and eventually it will stop working. Mm. And then the oil uh, consumers cannot log in, but you can prove that you did not hack anything. Mm. And if you um, say like, hey, we're Greenpeace, we're gonna, we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna like, um, if you're gonna do a real hack, you must um, say, I'm gonna use it from this IP address, I'm gonna use this method, <laughs> and you can check these logs to make sure that no database has been hacked. But if you're using a DDoS attack, you should not disclose your IP because then they can block it very easily. But it's technically impossible to, to access private information. So you're always in that side legal. Nice. nice. DDoS is not thanks. legal, by the way, but it's, <laughs> it's at least a gray area. Yeah. <laughs> nice, thanks. It's uh, very interesting. 
Yeah, can we respond? Because uh, on Monday we have uh, a workshop where we are going to try to really make the translation move uh, for these kind of actions and really try to look like, okay, maybe we can even find the page that you were talking about <laughs> and let's, let's find it on Monday. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now with the slides, can you make them available online for download? And with, for instance, all the cases you've mentioned, mm -hmm. could you cite them and like tweet them or mastodon them or something? That would be nice. Uh, Is there a way we can see? Yeah, that? I think so. Can yeah. you tell us now? I, we can also discuss with the organization how or where we can share it. That should be fine. Cool, thanks. Yeah. yeah I have uh, one remark and one question. A remark for the gentleman about DDoSing the website. It will not work. Uh, I'm working in <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've been working in marketing for 10 years and I know how these sites are being built up. So best case, you would get one edge node you could maybe get down, but everything is protected by like CDN or Akamai or without any real hacking, you would just not get a result that's, that's, that you would like. But I would like to talk more on Monday about that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But let's talk on Monday. Let's go. Or my, after this talk, yeah. also fine. My, yeah. my, my question is, um, if, if you do an action, who gets sued? Is that Greenpeace or are that the people performing the action? If Greenpeace acts as a protection for people doing the action, that could attract a lot more people be willing to do civil uh, disobedience if yeah. they're shielded by an organization. Yeah, it's uh, actually all, I think almost all cases, it's the activists. Um, and, but it's also a combination because the, the activists do the action in the name to have for, together with Greenpeace. So that means that uh, they have an organization like Greenpeace behind them, supporting them, also being there in court um, with the lawyers. Um, so it's Greenpeace supporting them and Greenpeace helping running the, uh, the court cases. Uh, but in the end, they want to uh, prosecute the activists. Okay. Um, but we, yeah, we don't have any um, cases where the activists were uh, heavenly uh, prosecutors because of those preparations. And that's where it starts. It starts when we are at home in our drawing tables, drawing down this action or at, at work uh, and saying, hey, we really need to take care of all these points because of a court case. Okay, so that's already you. prepared in advance. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey, so first of all, cool talk, thanks for sharing. Um, I do have a question regarding this preparation phase that you mentioned. Um, I would expect it's kind of easy when you're a Dutch person doing something on Dutch mainland, like taking an action, but then when it gets online, it gets much more difficult to grasp. How do you make sure that it's actually Dutch law that will be, avail that will be applicable? How do you make sure that you not, do not fall under like, foreign jurisdiction? And is it part of the technical analysis that, uh, that you have to conduct before co taking such actions? Or is it part of like a more legal approach? Uh, for the first question, um, I think you're uh, mean, you mean that if you hack a company that has servers in the US, for example. Yeah, not. sometimes you just yeah, don't exactly. know. You may have some edge cases yeah. where it has some impact on other companies, yeah. on other jurisdiction, for example. Yeah, yeah we, we also talked about that uh, with the cybercrime lawyer, for example, and he said that's a very difficult one, of course. And, you know, if you would start doing these actions, it would be smart to look into where our servers placed at the, for the first times and see, you know, uh, to make sure you're on European area or European law. Uh, and if not, that's the next step, I would say, because there is a chance that uh, the US will say, hey, the, the activists need to come here because we want to prosecute them. And that's a very tricky one. But uh, uh, I. I think what we said now, we would try to focus on European law and everything that's on European ground. Okay, cool, thank you. And the second question, uh, sorry, uh, I, I missed. I'm Did not you? sure there was a second no? question. No, okay, sorry, <laughs> I, I thought you had a second one, sorry. Yeah. Hello. Hey. <laughs> um, <clears throat> think about how to formulate it uh, properly. So there's, of course, the tension between uh, if you do something in public, it's nice, but then people know who you are. And we know that maybe sometimes uh, like people that don't necessarily follow the law, people disappear or stuff like this. Um, 
I don't know if you could maybe comment on the difference between like doing something privately or like uh, securely, let's say, so you don't know who's behind it, so nobody can be specifically targeted. Because usually it's just a few people that know the very specifics, and so like you just make their life horrible, and there won't be more of these attacks, let's say. So I think there's a bit of a tension between like doing something privately or like uh, anonymously versus publicly. I don't know if you've thought about this. It was partially ans answered a little bit by the preparation stage. Yeah. I think it's probably best to do everything out in the open uh, yeah. as, as, let's say, in the light as possible. Yeah. But uh, maybe you can comment on this. Yeah, we, we, um, we are still talking about this, but um, like I said before, um, this form of action, like what we're doing offline, we can get away with it. Like we do it for 50 years. Um, and I believe you can really copy that to an online place. And if you do it anonymously online, I think if they find you in the end, uh, I think the repercussions are harder. And are um, because we're open, and because Greenpeace is always saying, this is the activist, this is the organization, the judge is also more willing to be, hey, that you're doing it for such an such a important topic, you're have fighting climate change or whatever. Um, it really helps. So I, I, I know what you're saying, that there's like not, maybe not so many people who can do a really difficult hack, for example. Uh, maybe there are, I don't know. Or, or even activists like fighting for the Amazon. I don't know, what is it, like the yeah. highest number of activists disappear over there? Yeah, no, that's true. But that also, it depends on what action you're also doing, right? And what, what target. And, but with Greenpeace, it's, it's really like that, that we always show who we are. Um, but we do, um, I personally think it's important that you can do anonymous actions, of course, but that's not how Greenpeace um, works. Thanks. Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. okay, so the last two questions and then we need to continue. So, uh, to me it feels that the goal with the physical protest is to disrupt the companies to get their attention for a cause, right? Yeah. Uh, on Monday, we're going to go into four tactics, and sometimes it's also making public aware that something is happening, or a direct communications towards the people who can influence decisions. Uh, but we, now we focused a lot on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because the examples given, people boarding a drilling platform, yeah. you being in the trees, all that is preventing people their work, right? You being disruptive to that process, it costs them money, time, effort, whatever. If you translate that to online, you will not accomplish that with a WikiLeaks or Edward Snowden. You will not get there. If you go with the DDoS, you will not get there. So that means that you're, you're promoting to destroy or disrupt their infrastructure. And you feel that you can do that with your previous uh, offline case in the physical space. So is that what you're advocating? No, um, this is what we want to dive into on Monday to see like, hey, uh, if we do uh, a banner drop, uh, can we do a banner drop online? Like, is, that, is, it, is it translatable? That's called spam. I don't know. I, I, think that, um, I think that there's a lot of creative people, maybe here, maybe on the camp, maybe in the world, who can translate it into different things. Maybe it's true what you're saying. Maybe it's one of the tactics, but I think that also civil, civil disobedience comes in many ways, right? So I think there's ways to, uh, we have to hurry up, <laughs> yeah. uh, to, to look into that. Yeah, and again, like destroying things is not non-violent, and yeah. it's also not civil disobedience, it's more sabotage. Well, that, and that's the point you made. So, so I'm, I guess, confused, the room you give yourself, what you are able to do so online. Yeah, so yeah we're very digital processes, which I get, Yeah. but I think it's hard to accomplish with the uh, rules you give yourself. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's not easy, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, have you heard Hi. of the activist group Distributed Denial of Secrets and some of the environmental data sets that they released, like Mining Secrets? No. No. But that's a good tip. OK. <laughs> we, uh, maybe later you can say it again after the talk okay. and we can write it down. Yeah. OK, we have uh, two more minutes. So. Well, uh, one minute. OK, one minute. so oh. uh, attempt to check, uh, raise your hand if you agree with the statement. And you, it's OK if you uh, disagree, but just to get a feel of the room. What? Oh, one question. Uh, um, 
can we first do this, please? And then we can yeah. do it afterwards. Um, di direct digital action should be normalized like offline direct actions. Nice. That's also why you came to the talk, maybe. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's next? Um, we're uh, we're going to continue with the legal research. And we're going to do it out in the open. So we will uh, publish a position paper. And we will uh, host public events. And uh, then we're going to set up a team of people who can actually do this stuff. And uh, we're going to design the first low-risk action. So we're not just going to encrypt all the servers of some uh, oil company. Uh, maybe we're going to start it easy. We're, we are going to start it easy. And then on Monday, we're, like we said, we're going to try to really see if we can find uh, ways to make this translation step um, with hopefully all of y'all and your expertise. <laughs> that would be really nice. Yeah, so we'll be back. Yeah, and if, you're, um, if you want to contact, um, send me an email. Greenpeace email is on Google, so sorry for that. Uh, I have my uh, other email, which is RiseUp, which is much uh, better. We also believe that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, signal me or to send a telegram. Uh, like I said, we will be here today, and we will be definitely be there on Monday the whole day. So also, just come, come to us and talk to us. Uh, and we had one last question. Is that still OK? I'm looking at. Oh, when is the next hackathon? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I didn't plan one. We can organize one. Yes. Who would like to join a hackathon if we organize one? Nice. <laughs> some hands. Oh, we should get some numbers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's uh, that's it. Wait, oh, wait, wait, who's going to be here on Monday? Actually. Nice. Yes. It will be fun. Cool. Okay. Thanks. That Thank was you. Uh, that was it. <laughs>